Hello, and after a beautiful three-week break, thank you very much for that, this is episode 17 of Magic the Judging, where we teach you to be a better judge. Don't you love that? You love it. I know you love it. Um, we're going to talk about a bunch of random topics today, because what I'm mainly covering is what happened at the Welsh uh, World Magic Cup qualifier that I had the pleasure of officiating at at the weekend. Um, I tweeted that uh, we had an elite field of 20 players for the qualifier. Um, only a small amount of sarcasm in that tweet, really, wasn't there? I have to admit, I thought a 20-player qualifier was quite small, um, but I was quite surprised at the, the kind of the level of questions that I was getting during the event, because um, I kind of expected a 20-player and relatively casual tournament um, to not generate many questions, because most of the players in the room knew each other and uh, like trust each other to, to do stuff. Um, so yeah, I was I was pleasantly surprised at uh, how everybody was was using me, you know, the way the TO intended, like, actually asking me judge questions, actually getting me to verify situations on the table, uh, made it a lot. Um, <laughs> it made it uh, a lot more pleasant than uh, if I had sat there through five rounds of Swiss and a top eight without really doing anything. So yeah, I uh, very much enjoyed that one. And here I am just going to talk about some questions that came up for it. Um, as you know, if you're a regular viewer, um, I had <laughs> um, I had uh, I had a bit of three weeks off. Did I take three weeks off? Something like that. Whilst my wife um, had a marking contract, she marks exam papers. It would have been a bit tricky to have me streaming in this room and her marking another room. And then what would happen if the the kids got up uh, or the dog needed seeing to? Not in that way, but hey. Um, so uh, her market contract's over, which is great for a number of reasons, because um, it means that she's not working every single night now, and uh, we get some money in, which is brilliant. We love money. Money is good. Um, so now I'm back. I'm in front of the screens. I can get my Tuesday night geek on in this way. I'm sure you're glad to see me. Aren't you? I knew it. Okay, let's do it. What have we got? Let's go just go through them in the order I wrote. I've got my little little notepad. This really, really bad handwriting is pretty much everything that happened. So you can see I'm not going to go through much, but hopefully I'll get a chance to uh, go through it in a, a little bit of detail. Um, this is this is quite a cool thing to do, by the way. Whenever something happens. Uh, out the ordinary, very much in the ordinary, at a tournament that you're judging. It doesn't take much to have a little bit of folded up piece of paper. Just have it in your shirt pocket, which judge shirts have, so that's quite nice. Have a pen on you, which again you should have because you need to put penalties on result slips and so on. And then just after you've made a ruling, whip out a bit of paper, write like a one-liner that um, says what happened, and then you've got the opportunity to review it at another, another time and go, huh, um... I remember that happened, or, oh yeah, I wasn't sure about that ruling, I should ask on the judge forum, see, what, see if other people agree with me. I'm being reliably informed that girls' judge shirts don't include pockets, and, well, such blatant discrimination is, is unbelievable, to be honest. Maybe you have a, a pocket in the back of your jeans or something. Maybe that would work. It should be good, anyway. It's, it's quite easy to keep a, a bit of a, a notebook if you're really impressive, but I, I can never remember a notebook. What this actually is is um, it's a deck registration sheet that I just took and folded once, twice, three times. Now it's pocket sized. Yeah. Okay, so first call of the day. I had, uh, there was a Revenge of the Hunted just face up in the middle of the board somewhere, which uh, someone had obviously tried to miracle. Um, and there was an Ink Moth Nexus that was also in the middle of the table, tapped as if it was attacking. And the reason I was called over was because somebody was trying to cast Revenge of the Hunted as a miracle, um, targeting the animated Inkmoth Nexus that had already been declared as an attacker. So literally what happened, I went over to the table and this, this guy said, oh, my opponent's just um, animated and attacked with the Nexus, and now he wants to miracle this card. Uh, it's definitely the card he drew this turn, because he'd kept it separately, um, but I didn't think you could do that. 
So I just looked up over at the other guy and said, um, do, do you agree with the events as he's just described it? Like, is that what happened? I don't, I don't think I use such grandiose terms. I said, like, do you, do you agree that that's what happened? He's like, yeah, yeah, that's how it happened. And I had to explain that uh, um, you have to cast the card for Miracle like as you draw it. I used a pretty colloquial explanation at the time, but I've got the rules up now so that I can uh, double check exactly what you can do with this um, Miracle mechanic. And what it says is that it's a static ability and it's linked to a triggered ability. So there's two bits going on. It means the static part is you may reveal this card from your hand as you draw it if it's the first card you draw in this turn. So that's the bit that just lets you turn it face up. And when you reveal a card this way, there's the triggered part, you may cast it by playing cost rather than its mana cost. So it is possible, it is perfectly allowable to draw Revenge of the Hunted, reveal it, um, put the trigger on the stack, um, then animate the Ink Moth Nexus, then resolve the Miracle Trigger, casting Revenge of the Hunted for a single green mana, targeting the Ink Moth Nexus that is now animated. That does work, but um, this guy had gone a bit further into the turn and had not just animated the Nexus, but attacked with it. And because he's attacked with it, he must have gone past the point where the Miracle Trigger can possibly have uh, happened. So I had to rule against him. It's a competitive rules enforcement um, tournament. You know, at an FNM, with nothing else really happening that turn, I might say, oh, no, 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 if you wanted to cast that, you've got to do it right back when you draw it, and I might even let them go back and do it, something like that. It's um, much, much more casual kind of format. But strictly speaking, even even at that level, I'm interested, actually, in the in the chat, let me know. At a regular rules enforcement level tournament, like a nice, small, casual kind of FNM, would you let someone go back to their draw step to, uh, to miracle a card? If they'd done it wrong in this way, at competitive, it's definitely right out, and that's what I ruled. Um, I also decided not to explain how it should have worked, um, figuring that he could have come up and asked me about it at some other point in the day, which he never did. Um, did have in the back of my mind that maybe I should go and find him after the round had ended to go, ah, huh. but um, eh, I didn't, and as far as I know, he still did fine. You know having a deck that has the ability to make a 7-7 seven, seven Nexus and just pretty much smack a load of poison counters of death on you out of nowhere seems pretty good. So I had uh, another Ingmoth Nexus question, this time it was to do with Wolfgear Silverheart. Um, we had, uh, it, was, it was an interesting question, what happened the, that, sorry, what happened was I animated a Nexus and then played Wolfgear Silverheart and quite happily paired them both. Because they're paired, uh, the Wolf is Silverheart's other ability, like the, not the Soul Bond, but the kind of the, the paired ability, if you like, um, gave the Moth Nexus plus four plus four, I means it's five five, swings in, five poison counters, job done, very nice. At the end of turn, Ink Moth Nexus obviously returns back to being a land, and then the next turn, he animated the Nexus and attacked, and said, you take five poison, that's going to kill you. And the opponent was like, no, no, I only take one. He's like, oh, but it's paired with the silver heart. Which, of course, I had to explain is not the case. Um, I'm just double checking by reading the reminder text on here because I'm not sure what it says. It says in the reminder text that you may pair this creature with another unpaired creature when either enters the battlefield, and they remain paired for as long as you control both of them. But, of course, the reminder text doesn't always tell the full story. You don't want to rule off of the reminder text. You want to rule off of the ruling that's actually, sorry, the rules that's actually in 702.93, very close to 100 keyword abilities. Uh, the 93rd keyword ability, Soul Bond, is when this creature enters the battlefield, blah, 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 blah. Lots and lots and lots and lots of words. If you control both of this creature and another creature, and both are unpaired, you may pair this creature with another unpaired creature you control for as long as both remain creatures on the battlefield under your control. So they both have to be creatures, they both have to be on the battlefield, and they both have to be under your control. Now when Ink Moth Nexus like, de-animates at the end of turn, stops being a creature, that breaks the pairing. And it's actually explicit. If you look at the rest of um, 702.93, 
you get to um, uh, part E says that a paired creature becomes unpaired if any of the following occur. Another player gains control of it. The creatures or, or sorry, another player gains control of it or the creature it's paired with. It or the creature it's paired with stop being a creature, or it or the creature it's paired with leaves the battlefield. So essentially, there's like six ways to break a pair, um, three different methods, and it can happen on either creature. So I had to break it to him that he had attacked with a one one ink mod nexus. Um, now, because of the way it happened, again, he animates nexus attacks, nothing illegal at that point. He thinks he's attacking with the 5 5 Nexus, but actually he's attacking with the 1 1. This is competitive rules enforcement level. You're attacking with the 1 1 Ink Moth Nexus. And that's just how it happened. If you weren't sure about it, you probably should have asked the judge before you attacked. And that is the lesson of the day, really. Figure out what on earth is going on before you do it. Because after you've done it, it's a bit too late to correct your actions. Moving on. Zealous Conscripts. That lets you gain control of target permanent, which is quite cool. Um, you end up um, uh, you, you know, by stealing permanents. You can you can break pairs. Sorry, I just got thrown because I was trying to both talk and read a question in the chat, which I have been able to do up to now quite well, and uh, just threw me. But here we go. What happens if turn to frog is played on a paired creature? Does that lose all abilities bit? mean that it's no longer bonded? No, because being bonded isn't ability. However, one of the creatures has um, an ability that may means the pairing actually does something. So if you were to make that creature lose that ability, then whilst it won't stop being paired with the other creature, um, no one cares. Pairing doesn't inherently do anything. There has to be an ability somewhere saying that as long as this and that are paired, then they get something. That would make the pairing somewhat relevant at that point. Um, so yeah, moving on. Uh, zealous Conscripts can break pairs. But the question I actually had with Zealous Conscripts was that Zealous Conscripts had been used to steal, take control of uh, an opponent's sol Solemn Simulacrum. And whilst he had the Solemn Simulacrum, he thought, well, it's quite nice, I've got a mortar pod hanging around. I will uh, attach the Mortipod to the Solemn Simulacrum, and that'll let me sacrifice him, which seems good. Sacrificing a Solemn Simulacrum that you didn't actually own and you were going to have to give back at the end of the turn is quite a nice play. But the question I was actually asked was, when I do this, if I actually sacrifice the Solemn Simulacrum, do I get to draw a card? Um, I shall leave that one loitering in the air. Just for a moment, while you digest that. When Solemn Simulacrum dies, you may draw a card. Who are you? Who are you? That's in, that's in Alice in Wonderland, isn't it? I've got, got this picture of like a, a good picture in my head now of this blue caterpillar reclining and smoking a pipe and going, Who are you? Maybe I watch too many kids' videos, or maybe I just have crazy dreams. Anyway, who are you? You, you are the controller of the card at the time it triggers. So, who's going to be drawing a card here? I'm going to leave that one and come back to it. Nah. Talk about it in the chat, please. What else happened? Um, I was called over to uh, a very confused looking guy who had Doomblade out in his hand and uh, he looked across at his opponent's board um, I think they were playing some kind of zombies deck like there was a Geralt's messenger there was a blood artist there was some other weeny little zombies and he was like ah oh, I'm gonna doom blade um um ah oh, I can't doom blade any of them because they're all black they are all that thing that doom blade can't actually kill um, this one's pretty simple. The infraction is uh, a game rule violation for casting a spell without having any legal targets. Um, and I ruled... Well, it wasn't entirely clear that he'd actually selected a target, but I still opted 
to give the uh, give the warning, give the game rule violation, even though he hadn't actually selected a target at that point. Might be technically inaccurate, that one. I'm not 100% sure now I'm thinking about it. Um, but he realised that he, there was nothing he could target with the Doom Blade, didn't know what to do, so um, we obviously put the Doom Blade back in his hand, untapped the two lands that he had tapped to pay for it, and just moved on from there. Um, obviously he didn't cast Doom Blade targeting anything else, there wasn't anything for him to target. It's interesting to point out, though, that let's say there was a legal target on the board, there was a white creature sat there somewhere, and he had actually said something like, Doomblade targeting your Garros Messenger. Um, it's still a game war violation, because you're, tra- you're casting Doomblade with an illegal target. And um, I would still deal with this exactly the same way. I would rewind the casting of Doomblade, including putting it back in their hand and untapping the uh, mana sources that we used to pay for it. Um, that's important because a lot of people still have it in their head that if you were to cast a Doom Blade at an illegal target with a legal target on the board elsewhere, that you will have to cast a Doom Blade anyway and you have to kill the other thing. And it's just not true. Common misconception, that one. Um, on the subject of common misconceptions, Restoration Angel is a card. What does it say? What's its third ability? You know what its third ability is. It blinks something, doesn't it? Oh, wouldn't it be weird if Restoration Angel could blink itself? Well, it can't blink itself. So, yeah, obviously, what Restoration Angel does is it um, exiles a, a, a target creature that's not Restoration Angel and returns up card to food under your control. Yeah, that must be what it does. I think a lot of people actually believe that. It's not true. If you read it very carefully... When Restoration Angel enters the battlefield, you may exile target non-angel creature you control. So not only can Restoration Angel not target itself, as in the very card that you just played, you can't copy... You can't copy? Why am I talking about copy? It's because someone in the chat's talking about Phantasm Image. Grr. Um, you can't target any Restoration Angels at all. Um, not even another copy that you have over somewhere else. You can't target any angel at all. It's it's far more wide-reaching um, implication than that. Um, this wasn't a, a call at a judge. Uh, this wasn't actually a call from a match. Um, someone had a restoration angel in play. Their opponent tried to kill it with something. I can't remember. They targeted it with some spell that was going to kill it. And the opponent went, um, okay, I'll flash in this restoration angel and blink the other. And neither of them realised it was a problem. It was only because I happened to be watching the game that I realised that that wasn't actually possible. I had a quick fish around to try to work out if the guy trying to blink the Restoration Angel actually knew that it was impossible to do, um, which, of course, would lead to a cheating disqualification. But I decided, no, it was just an instant mistake. He thought it couldn't blink itself, but didn't realise it couldn't target any angel at all. Seems quite a simple mistake to make. Solemn Simulacrum, then, when you sacrifice it, yeah, you draw a card. Um, You control it at the time that the ability triggers. So you are the controller of Solemn Simulacrum. You is the controller of Solemn Simulacrum. That sounds grammatically incorrect, but if you put the right punctuation around it, it probably works, doesn't it? Um, So the person who sacrificed the uh, simulacrum would draw a card. Anyone point to the... Is there an explicit rule in the CR that says why that's the case? There's a mission for you. as homework. Find the rule for why that's the case. Okay, moving on. Beast Within. What does Beast Within do? It does two completely separate things. It's a targeted spell. What it targets is a permanent. What it does to that permanent is it destroys it. And then the controller of that permanent puts a 3-3 green beast creature token onto the battlefield. So what happens if you aim it at a Predator Ooze? Predator Ooze has got a whole bunch of text on it. But the key line for this scenario is that it's indestructible. 
What happens if you beast within an indestructible creature? Well, and this is the way I explained it at the qualifier itself, what beast within does is it targets a permanent. Predator Ruse is indeed a permanent, so it's a perfectly legal target. So the spell's going to resolve, it's not going to be countered, and because the spell resolves, first we destroy the target permanent. Except we can't do that because the target permanent is actually indestructible. But never mind. Having something in the text of a spell that you can't actually do doesn't matter. We just ignore that bit and carry on. Its controller puts a 3-3 beast into play. Brilliant. We can do that. It's not dependent on the destruction of the permanent. There's no if you do. There's nothing there to say that the destruction is actually important in relation to the token. So what happens if you beast within an indestructible permanent? Well, you give them a 3-3. Of course, if you're targeting your own indestructible thing, that would be a good play. But he wasn't. He was targeting his opponent's Predator Ruse, and um, that led to a bit of a laugh. Some giggling spectators, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, I had an interesting, uh, interesting policy thing then happened that was uh, nothing to do with any of the cards in play. Um, I had randomly selected a table for a deck check, and I went over to do the deck check, but I got asked a question as I was on the way over there. Um, got a little bit distracted, and then looked back at the table that I was going to check, and they'd drawn their opening hand. No matter, I said, I'd do the deck check anyway. Um, so what I did was I took their opening hand, I actually wrote it down to make sure that I didn't mess it up. Um, I did the deck check on both decks, and then restored the opening hand, and then gave them back their completely sorted deck, which they really needed to shuffle, which is always the case after a deck check, really, really shuffle your deck. We as judges will give you three additional minutes on top of whatever time we took off of you by doing the deck check. We'll give you three additional minutes so that you shuffle your deck. And the reason is we sort it out when we do a deck check. So uh, it's very important that you do that. Um, I gave them back their, their sorted deck, gave them back their sideboard, and then gave them back their opening hand um, and let them continue their mulligan decisions from there. So important takeaway moment. Just because they've drawn their opening hand doesn't stop you deck checking them. You can just go ahead and do that anyway. And I figured that, well, I needed to do a check. I may as well stick with the table that has been randomly selected. Um, what else did we have here? I, I had a... Uh, why have I, w w oh, yes, okay. Uh, someone cast Black Sun Zenith. That happens a few times. They cast it for X equals 3 when they had plenty of mana open because they really wanted to kill a Zealous Conscript that was on the table. Unfortunately, the Zealous Conscripts, as a lot of creatures are these days in Standard, he was carrying a sword. Sword of War and Peace gives plus two, plus two to the Zealous Conscripts. The Zealous Conscripts is actually a 5-5. Five, five. So despite having plenty of mana and being totally able to cast Zenith for five, they had cast a Zenith three. And when the opponent said, okay, great, good, put three counters on this. The original guy looked a bit confused, looked up at me, and I went, sword gives plus two, plus two. Unlucky. You're not getting the zenith back, so that's being shuffled in. Amusingly, before they could actually put the three counters on the conscripts, he went, oh, rubbish. Tapped four more mana and played um, uh, Dead Judgment. So he, he spent two rafts to kill one creature. Best play ever. Geist of St. Traft does some things. Um, one of the things it does, uh, which led to some confusion for me, was that uh, uh, it, it puts an angel into play that gets exiled at some point later. So they'd attacked with the Geist and they put a, a white card sleeve in play to represent the angel. And some stuff had happened. Then they passed the turn, and as they passed the turn, the uh, opponents pointed to the angel and said, like, that should go. Um, so he went, oh yeah, sorry, picked it up, put it to the side. And then he pointed at his opponent's um, blood artist and said, oh yeah, that needs to trigger. At which point I was kind of thinking, oh, this is weird, I'm pretty sure Geist exiles the token, and exiling doesn't trigger Blood Artist. Blood Artist um, requires things to die, and exiling isn't dying. Dying requires you to go to the battlefield, uh, sorry, to go from the battlefield to the graveyard. So um, 
I, I had a bit of a think about that, and it took a little while for it to dawn on me. Um, and after it had dawned on me, I thought, well, I, I'm going to... I better not drop this. I had better follow through and investigate. So what I did was I took one of the players away from the table and just kind of said, "Huh, oh, right, okay. Um, there was a white sleeve on the table. Can you tell me what that was? What was it representing?" Ah, oh, it was a four-four angel. Okay, and it your opponent passed the turn, and then you indicated that it shouldn't be there anymore. Yep, it's the guy's sent trapped angel, so it needs to be exiled. Okay, and then your opponent indicated that the blood artist should trigger. And you drained him for one life because of it. And she immediately went, oh, no, 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 no. That was from something else that we'd forgotten during combat or, or, or something along those lines. And I took it back to the table and I asked pretty much the same questions to the, the other guy, just led it the same way. And, uh, yeah, it was like, oh, no, 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 we know that doesn't trigger the blood artist. The blood artist was triggering from something else. That half satisfied me because, of course... Um, Realise if, if someone had taken advantage of the fact that their opponent had tried to uh, had, had explicitly allowed them to trigger blood artists off of exiling a creature, then we'd be in cheating territory again. So that one done, I then kind of stopped and thought, "Ha!" Huh, but if there was a missed trigger in there, then blood artist. Well, that looks very lapsing to me. A target player loses life, and you gain a life. Um, Somebody's probably going to correct me here. Is it actually lapsing? Because it causes target player to lose a life. I suppose the target can be an opponent. So that's what makes me think it's lapsing. It's not explicitly an opponent. Crikey, I'm confusing myself here. Somebody save me. Somebody in the chat, tell me, is this trigger lapsing? Well, I decided that because the opponent had pointed it out, and with the kind of demeanour that said, this should happen, then I interpreted that as, well, actually, it wasn't a missed trigger. Um, sorry, well, it, it was missed because it didn't happen at the right time. Because the guy pointed it out and wanted it to happen, then I allowed it to happen. And I didn't even bring up the possibility that it, it wouldn't happen because of the um, lapsing trigger rules. And then I had another double think on it because... I wasn't even sure if the guy knew about the lapsing trigger rules. Um, he's been a player who's been around for a long time, but that doesn't necessarily mean he's played recently. Of course, the lapsing trigger um, policy has been fairly recent. So I'm, I'm actually totally torn on this one. Um, I'm very interested to know what you would do. Would you interpret that as the opponent explicitly wanting the trigger to resolve? Or would you interpret it as... Or the guy's pointing out the trigger, but we should stick to the lapsing philosophy, which means it wouldn't happen. I'll let you mull that one over for a bit. Here's something that definitely can't happen with guys system trap, though. Um, I saw someone make a quite an interesting looking play, and everyone looked a bit um, perturbed because it was a play they hadn't seen before, and they all wondered how they could possibly have missed it. Someone attacked with guys St. Traff, they put the 4 4 Ranger into play attacking, and then in their main phase after combat, they played the Phantasmal Image to copy the 4 4 Angel, get one to stick around. I looked at that and thought, yeah, that's pretty nice, that's a nice way to get a free, for, well, pretty free, I mean, two mana for 4 4 Flying Angels, pretty good. Um, yeah, that's cool. And I, it was kind of nagging at me, why haven't I seen anyone do that before? Why haven't I seen anyone do that before? Turns out, I haven't seen anyone do that before because it's an illegal play. Because Geist of Traft doesn't exile the Angel token at the end of the turn. It exiles it at the end of combat. Probably exactly to stop this interaction happening, if I'm honest. Yeah. You can't... Unless you were somehow flashing the Phantasmal image in mid-combat, there's no way you could copy the 4-4 Angel. So there's something that I didn't realise and I had learnt at the uh, at the weekend. Um, Ether Vial also works, yes. Well done. Well done, Legacy Player. I suppose Geist and Traft is, is Legacy playable, actually, isn't it? Do you see much of Geist in Legacy? Seems plausible. Very plausible, in fact. But yes, it gets exiled at the end of combat, not at the end of the turn. Important distinction, as I learned. Surgical Extraction. There's a card. There's a card that uh, has you search your opponent's library for stuff. So that's an interesting thing. The way this interaction happened, this was this was in the top eight. 
in the uh, in the quarterfinals of the qualifier, a guy cast surgical extraction in game two, and uh, he extracted Doomblade, I think. So he went through his deck and took a couple of Doomblades out, and then goes. Um, uh, sorry, tell, got to tell the story properly. Player A played Surgical Extraction. Player B picked up his own deck and started exiling the Doom Blades from it. And the other guy said, oh, I can't be bothered to look through your deck. Can you just tell me what you sideboarded in? As I said, this was game two. I think they probably knew the deck or maybe he'd cast Surgical Extraction in game one. I wasn't around to witness it, so I don't really know. But he just said, yeah, all I want to know is what did you sideboard in? And then... What the, the guy reeled off a couple of cards. It was like, yeah, I did that. So I put in this one, this one, this one, this one. Oh, okay, all fine. And then about 30 seconds later, he goes, oh, and um, Khan, Khan liberated. I sideboarded him in as well. And I wondered to myself, has technically a player communication violation happened here? Because the guy was asked what he'd sideboarded in. Um, and he gave an answer that was incomplete and technically wrong because he did actually say at some point yeah that's all I sideboarded in before later correcting himself and going oh yeah and I also sideboarded in the Khan I'm very much of the opinion that uh, a player communication violation had not happened there because despite the um, information being freely available to the guy who wanted it um, I mean, your, the actual, the details of your sideboarding is, is obviously private. The, despite the fact that he could have looked through the deck and, and worked it out through knowledge of the, the deck, he could have just gone, right, what have I seen? What can I see now that I didn't see in game one? Um, I don't think that the guy was under any obligation whatsoever to be, uh, be like, on the button and admit to exactly what he'd sideboarded. Um I think the responsibility was entirely with the player of the surgical instruction to take advantage of what the spell actually does and look through the library himself if he really wanted to know. So I put this down to casual Welsh players just kind of going, oh, what did you do? And it, it kind of, it just sounded interesting to me. If someone played surgical extraction on me and then asked me, oh, what did you sideboard in? I could just make up any kind of rubbish. They'd be a bit annoyed later if they realised that I'd effectively lied about it. But um, would I have broken any kind of policy or any kind of rule in doing so? Well, I don't think I would have done at all. It just goes to show that um, being casual and uh, a little bit rough around the edges with, in a competitive environment is not necessarily good for you. So there you go. The same guy later attacked his Restoration Angel um, into a board that included Vault of the Archangel and he hadn't realised that there was a 1-1 spirit hanging around that can uh, um, gain Death Touch and, and kill the Restoration Angel. So he attacked and a couple of seconds later, maybe four or five seconds, he goes, oh, no, that's a bad idea, isn't it? Can I take it back? And I, I kind of looked up to just look at the look at the guy's face to see whether he was immediately going to go, oh, yeah, yeah, no worries. In which case I would have been like, well, whatever, you sort it out between you. But that wasn't immediately forthcoming. And I was like, no, you've, you've committed to it. You've declared an attack and there's been a, a good couple of seconds. Um, so he lost that game from there. I'm not sure that it would have made any difference. Then I went to go and watch another top eight, and one of them does exactly the same thing. Does an attack, a couple of seconds later, goes, ah, oh, no, that's a really bad attack, can I take that back? And I went, nope, you've committed to it. So, think about how you want to attack, and then do it. Or, be explicit about it and go, I'm thinking about my attacks. Yep, yep, I'm going to do it like this. Don't make it look like you've attacked when you're still thinking about it. That's a bad thing to do. Um, finally, we had a question about these guys. Miracle Bonfire of the Damned. Well, it doesn't matter if it's miracled or not. They um, 
Uh, it, it does some damage, it does X damage to target player and each creature he or she controls. The other guy was playing a bit of a Planeswalker control deck. He had out both Tamiyo and Gideon Jura, which must have been pretty good for him, really. Tap stuff down, kill it. It's quite a good combo, really. Um, but how does Bonfire interact with Planeswalkers? Well, because you're dealing damage to a player, you can redirect damage from the player to a Planeswalker, but basically you, get, you have to choose what it's going to hit. All of the damage to the creatures is still going to happen, even if you redirect the player damage to a Planeswalker, all of their creatures are still going to take the appropriate amount of damage. But there's no way to have Tamiyo and Gideon take damage. And there's no way you can have Gideon and the opponent take damage. Basically, there are three things. The player, Gideon Jura, and Tamiyo the Moon Sage, and only one of them is going to take damage from the bonfire. And that is how it works. So, nice short episode, I think. I've uh, enjoyed doing this one, being back after a little bit of break. Um, I needed to get back into the rhythm of it, so thank you for allowing me to have a bit of a shorter crack at it. Um, so we were talking about lapsing triggers. Let's have a look at uh, the most up-to-date lapsing uh, abilities that I've got in the IPG. Lapsing triggers are things that um, deal damage to an opponent or cause an opponent to lose life. Or um, cause you to gain life. Uh, if the lapsing ability could target ob an object that would make it a lapsing ability, then it's a lapsing ability even if it could potentially target other objects. So, yes, because um, I could target my opponent to have them lose life, with, this is the blood artist I was talking about, sorry, I'm not being totally explicit here, when we're talking about blood artist, does blood artist have a lapsing ability? Yes, it does, because whilst it says target player and I could target myself, I also could target my opponent, have them lose life, I can gain life. Both of those things exist under the lapsing uh, definition. So if somebody forgot their blood artist trigger, then they're not going to get them. It did. You know, I do still have that question in my head that because the guy pointed it out, because the opponent pointed it out, um, I let the trigger resolve and I didn't step in and say anything about the um, the lapsing ability, the fact that it was lapsing and, and that we didn't want, you know, we didn't, uh, the fact that because it was lapsing, he didn't have to point it out. And it was only some of his language kind of later in the day that made me think, oh, maybe he didn't actually know that he was allowed to let the trigger, well, lapse because it was lapsing. Um, I'm interested to know if uh, if people would would step in there. If you've got some comments, you're watching, you're not watching this live, you're watching this recorded, then uh, send me some tweets at Paul Smithanator. That's P A U L S M I T H E N A T O R. Paul Smithanator. P A U L S M I T H E N A T O R. That's my uh, Twitter account. You can always send me questions there um, about anything, really. Although, you know, if it's about private information, then uh, I reserve the right to uh, completely lie about my answer. Um, or you can contact me on the UK Judge Forums if you're on there. Um, and, oh, well, oh, bye Mark. Sorry, Mark's leaving because my stream's got a bit choppy for him. Sorry. It's all right, I'm finishing now. You won't have missed anything. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, send questions at me, send ideas of stuff you want me to cover. Um, I will be going deeper into policy in the coming weeks. Um, before the break, most, um, pretty much all, of my uh, streams were about the rules, so I'm going to dive deeper into policy so we can get that area covered, um, and uh, hopefully I'll put up a bit of a bit of a timetable, schedule, plan of what I'm going to cover in which episode, so that I kind of know how many I've got to get done um, before I, I call it a day on this. Um, but yeah, if there's something that you would like to have covered, then please let me know about it. Otherwise, just keep tuning in, keep coming into the chat. I love having you guys here live. It's, I kind of miss this, to be honest. Talking endlessly at my computer, just having little bits of text pop up and go, Hey, thanks Paul, this is good. Love you all. See you again next week. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.